Hello and welcome to the Goodnight Cafe. My name is Fumi and I am your host for today's podcast. I will be your host for every podcast um, for the most part. So I don't know why I said it that way. Um, anyways, I'm Fumi and it's really nice to see you tonight. Um, this is a podcast that I created inspired by those late night talks that we love so much. Uh, the only caveat is that only I am talking to you, but if you would like to respond, I have created an email for any of my listeners to ask me questions, um, give me any song, books, or movies, or TV shows, or anime recommendations. I would love that. So the email is goodnightxcafe at gmail.com. So totally send me an email introduce yourself a bit let me know who you are and you know use a fake name or don't use a fake name who cares um and hopefully i will get to respond to you in another podcast so i'm super stoked that i've created the opportunity to connect um so we can just get right started i'm i've been kind of in a good mood i don't don't know whether or not to say i've been like in a good mood like consistently i don't know that because you know throughout the day your mood changes but um something i'm happy about is that i just finished a book um it was by neil gaiman uh if you don't know who neil gaiman is he wrote bad omens which was turned into a tv show um and Coraline, that's a big one which is the claymation Coraline. um and stardust which is a movie that i'm not sure if a lot of people have seen um but those are three of his works that have turned into or productions or whatever you'd like to call it um that i know of uh, that i can give you an example of and i just finished his book called the ocean at the end of the lane and i really loved it i cried reading it because i was so touched um and actually if you are watching which you could watch the podcast on youtube too um that's definitely an option but if you're watching on youtube um i'm showing you the hardcover right now and it is beautiful it was illustrated by a a lady named illustrated by elise hurst um and the illustrations are really beautiful it's maybe 75% of what made me pick up this book, even though I'm pretty sure I've seen this book before and tried to read it before um, back in high school, but it wasn't as enticing as it looks now. I think this is a new hardcover edition with illustrations. Um, And it's the illustrations are great in a way that they just give you enough to grasp that you still have your individual interpretation. You still have... um, imagination integrity i suppose um but it's just enough to grasp maybe what's going on or maybe how neil gaiman envisioned the certain scene so that made me really happy just to get to enjoy it and really look at the book more from like a childlike perspective because uh and actually maybe that's the reason why he had it illustrated which i didn't even think about it and and why it almost looks like a children's book um because it's from the perspective of a child and and maybe now that i'm thinking about it and maybe the reason why it the illustrations are so abstracted is because there is a theme about memories and, and what you can remember as a child and how um how your memories of when you were a child can be distorted of, uh, to a certain extent maybe uh, whether or not they're trustworthy actually um <laughs> in the last page there is a quote that i'm trying to look for right now that um one of the women says uh when they're recalling um they're recalling what happened in the past in his childhood and she basically gets on his case saying that no one remembers the same thing quite the same well i can't find it right now because i didn't have it prepared but that's okay um and so there's this kind of idea of memories and remembering things as a child and maybe the reason why the illustrations are this way and not exactly something that you can grasp and and not incredibly detailed more abstract or um, interpretive might be to represent how we as you know how we remember things so that's amazing i didn't even think about that till now and it has me so excited but um yeah i love this book um little secret though this is my like maybe fourth time trying to film and record this podcast um and i've talked about this book two separate times beside that this that's what it (laughs) that's what it means or not two but maybe three times before and the thing about this book is that it freaks me out a little bit it freaks me out because it relates to things in my childhood and that 
I don't love to remember and actually don't love to talk about. Um, so it, it freaked me out a little bit and having, uh, what freaked me out is, so there's two things that I'll probably talk about today. One is how I loved the theme of childhood and the theme of adulthood or not not necessarily adulthood but um the disconnect between children's and adults um but freaked me out a little bit in one respect because it's coming from the perspective or this book is coming from the perspective of a seven-year-old boy and the characteristics that i relate to is that this seven-year-old boy who is unnamed actually in the story he is extremely afraid of the dark he has a wild imagination he doesn't have any friends he's very like this kind of lone wolf wolf type of boy who you know still finds he's not like um crouching in the corner or without anything to do he still finds things to do on his own and he loves to be alone and to have his time on his own and enjoy things and enjoy the world around him but he just doesn't have very many friends uh he doesn't have any friends um until he makes you know friends with the girl that he meets in the store by the way if you don't want any spoilers i'm so sorry i'm gonna spoil I'm definitely gonna spoil this book for you so if you are interested in reading the ocean at the end of the lane maybe read that first and then come back and listen to my podcast and consider what i'm saying and if i and then respond in an email and let me know what you think um but yeah uh i relate i relate in the same oh and he has nightmares um like really vivid nightmares that really affect him as a little kid and um the nightmares that he has is used as one of the elements that relate back to the disconnect between children and adults um and the and how he couldn't rely on adults to tell his dreams and what he's scared about and he feel, felt like he was going to in some circumstances he felt like as much as he wanted to depend on the adults around him about the dreams that he was having that was terrifying him he couldn't because he felt like they were going to be people were going to ridicule him um and then it just felt like repeatedly he he always had to go to the struggle of i should go tell my mommy and my daddy and 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 go for them for help but how would they ever believe me and how would they ever trust what i'm having to say and they'll think i'm ridiculous and i don't want to trouble them and there's this whole cycle that this little boy goes through repeatedly throughout the entire story just struggling to trust and rely on authoritative figures um but the whole idea though of of how he's particularly scared of the dark and particularly has dreams and in a very vivid imagination and has no friends those were all characteristics from my childhood and so it was almost very triggering to me in a sense um not necessarily triggering but it was just so it hit just a different part of me that i never um I guess it's not something that I've ever related to any other person uh, before. Like, I don't think I've, I might have met other people who maybe have had sleep paralysis before, but not as much trouble as I've had. Um, And for me, and hopefully I can sleep okay tonight. Um, Because it's, surprisingly, when I talked about it yesterday, I ended up having a little bit of sleep paralysis last night, um, which is really weird. I think it was just because subconsciously I was um, very the whole idea of having nightmares was stuck in my head and I was really afraid of having nightmares again and I think it kind of manifested that in my subconscious and ended up having nightmares um so it's it's not something I'm completely over but I think um I've developed techniques to not be as afraid and to kind of get my head in the right place um but as a child I had loads of sleep paralysis and I had very vivid, and I still have very vivid dreams today, but, um, I had, I, I, it still goes on, like, you know, still very prevalent in my childhood, and, and I was a lot more scared of my dreams as a child, and whenever I went to an adult about how I had a very vivid and scary dream, and I couldn't get over it, um, as much as my, like, adult figures were trying to offer me help, and as much as they were trying, I knew, like, no, looking back now they were trying to deal with it as best as they possibly could and they the way they did that was by just dis, not disregarding but to classify it and to tell me that it's not reality that it, it's just a dream and and that it didn't matter because it's not real um but what i felt was real and and to 
be told that like my feelings weren't real and 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 me being scared wasn't real and what i had felt like i had experienced wasn't real and i didn't get to express my emotions it was it was scary and lonesome and and i felt like i couldn't rely on adults and so when the child in the story has those experiences which is quite frequently i felt it and i felt very like i felt that weird sense of disconnect from adults and it's not this blatant the way neil gaiman does it is that it's very realistic in the sense that a child doesn't necessarily just lose all trust in adults and then and then and then just like i don't know shut them out completely uh for him his his parental figures his mother and his father he will always love them he will always crave their adoration because they're his parents and no matter how unreliable they are to him and how much he struggles to trust them with what he's feeling he still expresses his desire to be with them no matter how much they've hurt him abandoned him or or discredited themselves he's still a seven-year-old boy that yearns to have this kind of love and, and trust and connection with his parents so he'll always you you might wonder like oh why is this kid like continuing to try and cry over his father and strive for his father like his father is screwed up his, his father is neglecting him his father is not a figure that he should be relying on nor is his mother but he still craves that desire so so i i guess my point is is that neil gaiman the way that he goes about showing this disconnect isn't as blunt as i might be talking about um but definitely i i find it so interesting that he uses these kind of fears that the child has and, and the dreams that he has to to use as a way as almost like a vessel to show that disconnect it's just really interesting and it's hard it might be confusing to those who have not read the book and hopefully i'm, I'm talking about it in um a very clear way but um yeah um for my sleep paralysis thing when i was a child just so that you guys can get a little perspective of like how much i relate i suppose or like i guess what my experience was um and how it's affected me maybe if you've had this experience totally let me know because i haven't actually met a lot of people who've dealt with um like very vivid and terrifying dreams as a kid um the same way i have maybe i have and i just can't remember because i don't know but um i think it screwed me up a little bit um it i've only very recently been able to get a better hold on it on on like my fears and stuff just maturing more and, and um coping with it better but uh, when I was a kid, so when I say very vivid dreams, I guess there's a lot of nightmares I remember. Maybe I'll talk about them more in the like in a different episode of like certain dreams that I remember very vividly. I think that would be a fun topic to kind of do some storytelling about. Um, but I there were nights where I would get so freaked out and and want to go to my parents room but i would get stuck in the hallway because i think i was still in like a half sleep state and i would maybe hallucinate i'm not sure if i was hallucinating or just getting in my head i don't know what it was really it felt like sleepwalking but i knew that i was trying to get to my parents room and i was just stuck in the hallway frozen not being able to move and i would be so terrified and then i would just fall asleep even talking about it now like it makes me nervous because i'm just like i'm like being stuck in that place where it felt so alone and just felt so scary and it's just like like it's one of those things though if you see if there was like a camera there it's just a little kid like in the hallway like frozen scared of the dark and so that was me very often and i would fall asleep in the hallway and then my parents would find me in the hallway in the morning and just be like why are you there um i don't even know if they remember that but i would end up you know because i would try so hard to get to um their room and then um, not make it um and for nights where i couldn't move i was stuck in my bed and, and just couldn't move and i was just terrified and um yeah so there were lots of nights like that it's hard to um it's hard to even now i'm kind of like sweating scared i don't know i just feel like 
maybe I'm not ready to talk, to talk about this yet. It was a very, I had too many nights like that and I, I just, um, I don't think any of my parental figures really understood what I was going through. And I, I don't even, I wasn't even sure what to tell them. I was just, uh, and if it was a scary dream, I think I've already said this before, but it's just that they, they extracted it from reality. Like my, they didn't validate any of my feelings that I had. They just said it wasn't real and, and then I couldn't go to anyone. So I was at a loss. Um, so, and then for a very long time, even very up to recently, like I, I have not been able to handle like horror, I've not, I haven't been able to handle like walking around in the dark very often, and and I don't even like to say this out loud because it feels almost like I'm, like I believe like words have power and you have the power, and and this is also like a Christian idea too of like words hold the power of life and death. Um, so when you there's an idea in Christianity like when you speak words, you're bringing truth and life uh, or death. Um, out into the world and, and it almost might sound like manifestation which I don't want it to sound that way but um, there is an idea in the Bible that was just like you whatever you speak out loud you know it starts to become a part of you and that's why it's important as like a Christian to speak positively over yourself and to um, and, and really it makes sense because of the idea of like cognitive uh, behavior and certain techniques that you use to be able to frame yourself in more positive perspective so the whole this whole me talking about like my dreams and talking about um my fears almost like makes it more real and brings it into life rather than just staying silent about it and not necessarily necessarily addressing it because i don't want those fears to have to like, I don't want to give it so much power, and I think it's so, it's such a weird thing, because people would, I feel like people would tell me to address it, to to bring it to life, and to take a hold of it, and to, I don't know, deal with it by bringing it to life, in a sense, um, and to talk through it, but for some reason, I'm feeling a lot of resistance to even talk about the extent of my fears and stuff, so... I'm sorry if I'm being really complicated right now, but um, it's kind of what I'm going through when it comes to talking about this topic. And, um, you know, not even many of my very close friends know or think that this is a very prevalent thing in my life, like um, being fearful of the dark or, or, you know, getting in my head and being paranoid of of things, not being able to watch horror movies. Um, I, I like everyone loves Coraline. Um, and I don't know why so many people in my life have tried to convince me to watch Coraline, but as a kid, seeing all of the trailers for Coraline and the whole, like, idea of it, like, I will take Coraline or any horror movie that I watch and it will, like, take over my mind for days and days and days and days. Um, and I'll, like, end up fantasizing about it and, and immersing myself into it and it's just a nightmare. Um, literally and figuratively. So yeah like it's not just the dreams and childhood I, I mean it is a lot to do like I don't know really I just get scared and paranoid very 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 easily and I think it's just because I either overthink or I over analyze and I get very immersive in the things that I'm I consume and I I watch and I I think about every you know one small thing that ends up happening I end up thinking and overthinking and, and replaying it in my head over and over and over. So certain images, certain um, fears, and I don't know, I just get so absorbed. Um, I'm so sorry if I'm being confusing right now. I am sorry, but I'm not sorry because we're kind of in this. Um, and um, yeah, so I am hypersensitive to those things and people don't I don't think anyone in my life really knows the extent of my fears um, and how easily, how hypersensitive I am. You know what? I don't even like the word sensitive anymore for some reason because I just feel so weak when people 
label me as oversensitive or overreactive or, you know, sensitive in general, but I don't know how to deal with it. I mean, it's a part of me and in, in, in thinking very in depth about things and trying to understand every angle of everything is such it's so a part of me and I can't get rid of it. I, I just don't like having to have that weird connotation of she is oversensitive, overthinking, and it's like such a weakness and I hope it's not. Um, I think I've just, um, cause I've been, I've been thinking about that characteristic in myself because I've had a lot of, um, I wouldn't call it conflicts, but I just had a lot of like relationships in my life as of recently that, I've had to think of over and over and over again and just contemplate and analyze the people in my life and um, see it from their perspective um, and really, I don't know, I've, I, I guess it's given me a bit of anxiety, but it also, it takes a lot of time for me to process, like, where is this person coming from? Where are they at in their life? Uh, how do I best show them kindness? How do I best... Um, you know, how, how do I create peace between me and the other people in my life and understand who they are? And so, um, uh, but a, a part of it has been me telling myself, like, am I just being oversensitive? Do I need to think about this so much? Um, or am I thinking about this too much? Um, is it really something, is the answer really something a lot more plain? Um, and I don't have an answer to that. Um, I still think people, and I hope that people are, are just more complicated than I can understand. It's not something very simple. Um, you know, day in the life of an overthinker. Um, what is a better term for that? I would, I could really use a better term for that. Um, but yeah. Okay, well, yeah. The Ocean at the End of the Lane. It's a really good book. Neil Gaiman is a really good good author um he's written so much though and i i i'm very scared when it comes to picking up new books because i always feel like no book will measure up to what i've read before uh, the ocean at the end of the lane it really did i had to power through the beginning because it seemed a little bit bland at first and i didn't understand the context um but for you you might want to understand the context if i've enticed you enough um the Ocean at the End of the Lane does have a little bit of a fantasy magical twist that I was not expecting, and it creeps up on me. Um, it crept up on me very sneakily um, and caught me off guard and enticed me completely. So, it's a great book, a great read. Uh, I cried and I loved it. Um, my favorite Neil Gaiman book is Stardust. Uh, it is an adult fairy tale, um, and it's just, you know, number one, top book. I absolutely loved it. I just went to Tucson, which was a place where Neil Gaiman, um, Neil Gaiman was at some sort of fantasy convention, and he was in the desert, Tucson's a desert, and he was looking up at the sky, and he just saw a star fall, and that's what inspired him in this idea of of what would it be like to catch a falling star and to chase a falling star and and he came up with this world called or you know a, a town called wall and um yeah he, he basically came up with the idea for stardust in tucson arizona um so i got to visit there very recently it was in march um and it was beautiful tucson's very beautiful um but yeah i love neil gaiman and I, I don't really know too much about him, but he's written a lot of good books, and I think I might try and read one more of his. Maybe Bad Omens is next. Um, I think I tried before, but I don't know. I'm, I really love fantasy, and I love magical books, but um, I feel like there's I don't, I, I like sophisticated fantasy, like really well-written fantasy, um, and I just don't know where to go to find that, because I didn't actually grow up reading a lot, um, I read what I like to read, 
Like in high school, I was very, I'm actually, I've always been very picky about books. So almost every book that I've read all the way through has been like my favorite book because I made all, I made it all the way through and it, it brought me along the ride. Like I will quit a book as soon as it, you know, if it doesn't catch my attention, I will quit it and not look back. Um, so if you have any recommendations for books, um, that are kind of fantasy-like, have a magical twist to it, um, princes and princesses, I love that, um, totally, totally let me know, email me, uh, at goodnightxca- goodnightxcafe at gmail.com. I would absolutely love that. Um, what I've been up to this week, I've been working on, there's a song that I really like, um, by Sam McPherson. I think I'm saying that correctly. He's on Spotify. Uh, he's an up and coming singer that I think has so much talent and is really amazing. I found him on TikTok because I am on TikTok at Fumi Bean. Um, and I just love his singing. And I actually, he came out with a song just today. It's April 9th. Um, he released it. Um, it's called Last Minute, and it's really cute. It's about how he was going off to LA to pursue music, but the girl that he had been talking to finally admitted that she loved him and wanted him, um, but it was Last Minute, so hence the name of the song, Last Minute. And it's a great song. It's super good. It's super well produced, um, and I made a little animation for it um, that you could also find on my TikTok because um, I just wanted to support him, and I think that's actually something new that I'd like to continue doing is making animation for singers and for, for songs I really like um, and that I can see kind of like a vision for. Um, hopefully that doesn't take up too much time out of um, what I want to be doing, which is like I'm, I'm kind of working on this kind of short story um, and short story animation to go with it. So hopefully it won't distract me too much. Um, but I do love doing it just because like I want to be able to support songwriters and and singers and um I love music it's just such a big part of my life um so yeah that's something that I'm kind of getting into something that I really love doing this week um and you'll be able to see if you see me on social media I'm my username is Fumi Bean almost everywhere um Fumi Shisetsu is my like fashion account um and yeah my brand is kind of everywhere like I do podcasts and uh I sing sometimes and I draw a lot and then I sew and then I um do fashion stuff so I am embracing everything that I love for sure um and hopefully not spreading myself too thin um but yeah catch me around there see me throughout the week um and I hope you enjoyed this podcast it was really fun to be able to talk about um the ocean at the end of the lane I didn't want to I wasn't sure if I should go too in depth or have a very analytical approach to talking about this book because it wasn't supposed to be a full-on book review and if that's something you're that you're interested in maybe I could do that um but I love to go on tangents, so I'm not sure how well that would work. Um, but, and maybe I should have maybe read off a synopsis or something of the ocean at the end of the lane, but it's really hard to describe in the first place. Um, and maybe I'll talk about it again in, in another episode if I feel so moved to do so. Um, but yeah. Thank you for being here today. I really appreciate you. And um, something that I have learned recently is that you sometimes have to be discerning and accept the things that you don't know and have the discernment to change what you can change and know when you can't too. Let's do our best to just extend kindness and love to everyone around us, um, even if they don't deserve it. So um i love you guys you know if you're not having a good night or if you're not having a good day um i will be praying for you guys so that's the best i can do at the current moment um whether you believe in god or don't believe in god i will go to my higher power and 
do the best I possibly can so that any of my listeners and anyone who's listening right now will just know that I'll be praying for you guys and um you sleep well. Good night. Just a humble bounty hunter, man.